Facebook friends, I was recently asked by our wonderful director of Indigenous Cultures, Yolanda Blue Horse. She is a phenomenal woman, and she is going to be speaking out the Holocaust event. But I know that not all of you are going to be able to go to Cinnamon Pack's event out there, which is focusing on trafficked women, the history of that, and how it's occurred around the world. I encourage you to go out there. Yolanda is focusing, of course, on missing and murdered Indigenous women, and she is a phenomenal speaker. So do go out there and listen and learn more about it. I believe it begins at 3 o'clock this Saturday at the Holocaust Museum. Simon Pack will be talking about comfort women. Those were the women that were kidnapped through World War II and forced to basically prostitute themselves. And they included people throughout Asia as well as a lot of American nurses that were caught during World War II were also forced to go into that. So powerful, powerful things that will be out there. And in the middle of it, I was asked to put together the backdrop for our organization. And I realized that in doing so, it really told the history of the Mimsy Institute. So this is very informal, but I'm going to walk some of you through there because I think it's pretty fascinating what we've done. So this just gives you an idea of the work that we've done in the world. But, you know, one of our absolute earliest programs was an interfaith event that happened in Dallas at the Arbor Week, and we were blessed to have people come from all over the place. You know, these were um, the Hopi um, that were participants in that. Um, anyway, and that led to the signing of the Hopi and Navajo Alliance, which was the very first um, you know, treaty alliance in 300 years between those tribes. So we went shooting out the gate. We now have a chapter in Japan, and it began because we have wonderful Shinto. This is Reverend Tanaka, who, um, sorry, Reverend Inui, who is right there. And there are two different types of Shinto. For those who are not familiar with Japanese culture, it was very unusual to have different Shinto actually getting along and working together on that. One of our earliest programs, which we are now reviving, in part with organizations associated with Richard Branson's Our Coloring Book Program. And it was launched in Rwanda, where people that identify themselves as who, um, you know, his two different tribes were actually Rwandis, had to learn that, oh, wait, you know, that was all a lie. There's no such thing as Hutu and Tutsi. We're actually Rwandis. And it helped because they were able to see people from all over the world in Asia, people living in igloos like the Tlingit, to people in Cambodia. And in the process, as the children colored those books, they realized, oh, wow, we actually have more in common than we realize. This was a cultural exchange we had with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And, um, Talhuis Kempentakutli, who is Ricardo Cervantes Cervantes, the Toltec leader, spiritual leader, um, down in Teotihuacan, where we now have one of our cultural centers. And that was a profound experience between the two of them. A lot on that. Um, we found out, of course, in, you know, the Toltec Nahuatl language, that's the place where men become gods. And uh, Tibetan, that word actually means the house of great spiritual treasure. Um, this was an event we had with Rice University, SMU, all sorts of different things we did with the Osmali groups, UTD. It was a huge event and it was on sacred geometry and in all ways that that applies. It could be biological, it could deal with the formation of crystals. Stephen Stefano, um, he was on our board now on our advisory board, did an amazing lecture on that with his work with Keith Richlow. Um, but it was phenomenal and it went into every aspect, um, psychology, it was amazing. Um, this is our work with Standing Rock and which we helped um, pay for uh, different wonderful people like Michelle Cook, who are the water protectors. They were the uh, attorneys that were helping to get the protesters out of jail because they would be stripped and put into chicken coop wire places and sh um, showered with freeze water under freezing temperatures. So once we were able to provide them uh, tents and things, they were able to start writing a lot more uh, you know, um, legal papers to get people out so they weren't subjected to those kind of horrible things, which was being done by energy transfer partners. Um, of course, we have our wonderful initiative, Oak Cliff Earth Day, which um, one of our um, founders, Coke Buchanan's sister, um, ended up helping Lebo Buchanan to found. And um, we had a number of wonderful indigenous community that came out, and our executive director, of course, Philip Collins. Walk you through some more of this. This is Her Excellency Oye Aina Olomo. She was the first female Yoruba chieftain in all the Americas. Absolutely remarkable woman, third to the throne in Benin. And of course, many of you know Anthony Chisholm, who is now a reverend. Just amazing, beautiful man that's been with us through this whole journey from the beginning. Um, this is when we were at the United Nations. And while the award was given to me, it is obviously a team that makes any of these things happen. And it was the last big trip that my mom was able to take before she, I mean, she had already Already had some Alzheimer's, but all of us were working together. Um, Kalu Uormo, you know, one, um, he's from the Igbo tribe in Nigeria, and he is also very successful on Wall Street. And uh, you know, now he and I also have a company outside of uh, 
the Anthem MC Institute, which we are using to help try and find for-profit means of collaboration as well, uh, you know, within the nonprofit world. Um, of course, our executive director, Philip Collins, one of the spiritual leaders of the Apache people, Muscalero and Yvon, um, sorry, Lepon, um, Gregory Gomez, my husband, Joshua Frank, and you know, various other, oh, Marcella Gerber, who one will tone it to you, he's one of the Tolteca, and Isabel Rosignol, absolutely incredible woman, and I'll tell you more about her later. This was when our organization got an award from the city of Dallas, and it really, well, I'm the one holding it here, it is Reverend Dr. Todd Collier, who's just worked his butt off to make that happen, and did such an amazing job of getting shoes and um, and everything to you know, children, um, and it grew to be so huge. We ended up stopping it right before, um, basically doing COVID. Um, but I just, and also of course, want to recognize uh, Reverend Karen Holly played a major role in that, and her late husband uh, Bishop McGriff. So. Anyway, we have one of our uh, chapters. This is Angel Salub, and he heads up the Mayan Cultural Center, and this was just one of the amazing things that they did recently with um, UNESCO. And so they were recognized by UNESCO and the UN for their work, and he has traveled around the world now doing stuff with that. Um, this is our annual event. Many of you know um, Wendell Withrow, and he has been doing amazing work ever since um, Dr. Philip Shinoda retired. He used to be in charge of the Sierra Club and he is now in charge of the Mimicine Institute's work in the environmental area. So every year we have a big event in which we give out awards to people that the public votes in the DFW area who are doing fantastic work. And obviously you can see this was Everest McMillian. He got the Environmental Justice Award that year. Over here, during COVID, we ended up having to obviously focus on what people really urgently needed, and one of those things was KN95 masks. So we got hundreds of thousands of them all over to Native American communities because they were one of the communities that were not being served. So um, our cultural centers participate in that, and this is Ricardo and his, um, while they are Tolteca, they ended up getting them to tribes all over Mexico. So that was significant. Many of you know that we have uh, been working with architect Heath Critchlow. This is one of the buildings that he um, designed for the Mimicine Institute. Um, Green Source DFW, as you all know, is one of the biggest initiatives that we have after environmental writers stopped um, publishing, um, being allowed to publish or being invited to publish in the United States, um, sorry, <laughs> largely, but especially here in Texas. And so we ended up hiring a lot of them. And Wendell, first Philip Shinoda, then Wendell heads up that, now Jilly Thibodeau. And now they have launched this wonderful um, thing on Audible. So go check it out. Uh, this is one of those areas where the indigenous and environment overlapped. And again, people from all over the world. Um, we had people from Russia, people from Africa, people from India, and they decided what environmental philosophy was. And you can see it took a long process of agreement, but it was absolutely incredible to participate in. Work that we are currently doing, uh, many of those who are older will know Andrew Young. He is um, one of the people that was very close with MLK um, locally, Reverend Peter Johnson. Many of you will recognize that. Um, this is, you know, Andrew's um, brother, and so some obviously clue um, those working on this project. And Isabel Rosignol, many people don't know that she actually was the person that MLK selected to help organize the students in Louisiana in the fight um, for desegregation. So she has a long history with that. So obviously we are doing a building of construction um, thanks to Mike Hogue who donated land um, behind Dallas City Hall. We'll be putting our Center for Outreach and that's global and local outreach. And the whole focus of that is not just on our outreach programs, but on what can make outreach in general better. And there's so much behind that that is its own dialogue and presentation, but that's what it is. This was a documentary that we did from our very first event that uh, Joshua directed and many paths one source. And um, so that was one of our very first programs. This is you know, the Mule Empowerment Project. And it really came out of when Mayan children were invited to go see pyramids for the first time because the irony is in Mexico, they usually can't afford to see their own history. We pay for them to do that, but we asked them before they went what they wanted to be when they grew up. They said they wanted to um, be a housekeeper or a gardener like their parents. And then after they went through it, they ended up saying, oh, I want to be an architect, I want to be an engineer. And we were so struck by the difference that we realized we need to find a way to bring it to the urban environment. So it takes the form of basically like a giant size coloring book, um, almost about the size of this 
thing in terms of width, but much longer. And it's now gone into Washington, D.C., New York, Chicago, um, the Gullah tribe out in Atlanta. And here in Dallas, we worked with the African American Museum. Thank you, Harry Robinson. And people came in from the stupa and all sorts of places, and they ended up coloring it. And what it does is it tells a more complete story of history instead of African Americans who were originally kidnapped from Africa from ignorance and then worked their way up now. Actually, it starts with um, you know, going all the way back you know, pre-Egypt to the Nubian Empire, showing the incredible things that had occurred there with architecture and mathematics and whatnot, taking that up into the Egyptian, then going into the, how that influenced Timbuktu, um, going into all the different history of that and eventually into Cordoba and showing how so much was accomplished before the advent of slavery. And so what they're doing now is a return to achievement as opposed to a first time in history, which is a very powerful change. Mind. All of our work that we do around the world um, we now you know, have chapters all over, um, but you know, it either deals with the environment, science, economics, and technology, health and medicine, art, global local outreach, which is like a science in itself, not just the outreach, interfaith inquiry initiatives, indigenous cultures, and spirituality. We find that this really allows us to discuss globalization in a way that if you can address all these, you can really come up with sustainable solutions to things in the world. This is outdated already, but Food Source DFW is one of our most amazing kick-ass programs, and it is led by Reverend Dr. Todd Collier. Truly, millions and millions of dollars worth of food that would have ended up in landfills are now not just bought space in Dallas Fort Worth. It is served up into Chicago. It's served in the Puerto Rico. It's served in the California. It's served in Atlanta, and we are now um, talking to Imam Abdul. Um, <clears throat> Imam Faisal, who is talking about trying to do a tri-state chapter, uh, which we are super excited about. This was one of the launches of our, um, you know, incredible, well, this wasn't the launch of it, this was a program that they had, but we have a um, chapter in Japan, and so they do wonderful work with people from all over the world. Um, Green Source DFW, as I mentioned before, they, this was one of their race, the race for environment. As you can see, this is an image of some of the children that were out at the Mayan Cultural Center, which is Large Maya. Um, over here, this was in Austria, one of our most <laughs> absolutely brilliant team members, Thomas Q. Johns, and he is a, you know, developing an AI understanding of the vital signs monitor, which is based on spiral dynamics. Um, this it will be installed into the Center for Outreach downtown. And of course, you know, here you have Philip Collins. Um, and so we're all collaborating because this is, he's designing the tool. Philip knows how to do art and interactive installation. And this is the Ars Electronica who's helping us to oversee the actual full thing that will be in the building. Um, it will enable people to look at the information objectively and literally diagnosing. Because before we were able to do the food source program, we spent three years of doing data research. And that kind of thing could be done in mere minutes if you actually already have the data into the AI. So that is a way that you can actually improve outreach. And that's how it's going to be a service to the community locally. And our end goal, of course, is to have one done for the world based on the sustainability development goals. Marva Hanks and Burton Hanks, we can't say enough about them. They really have gone all out to help us when we end up doing all of our um, our work and, you know, the... Uh, for Juneteenth, our big events. So lots of lots of gratitude to them. Yeah. The Tolteca, wonderful meeting, what they do. Um, they have amazing things in which they're bringing um, sustainable development goals, educating. Um, just there's a whole, uh, you know, each one of these cultural centers does so much work, it's impossible to, <clears throat> to quantify all of it. But I just wanted to give you an idea, the amazing Reverend Dr. Todd Collier and his little son, um, Rowan, um, and what he was able to do during, you know, you know during the, um, you know, during COVID's worst, he still ended up going out there and tripling the kind of impact he was doing. You know, we have wonderful people, you know, like Abner Samuel, who've come out and cooked for veterans, and Yolanda is also a veteran, so she helped organize this wonderful initiative, and we're going to be doing that every year, um, and you can see, you know, what, what that's about. It's about getting turkeys to them, and food, and things that the veterans are so often forgotten and need. Um, Yolanda, again, this is her. She will be the one speaking out there, so do go out there and take a good look. Um, of course, a little glimpse of what we have the Mind Cultural Center. And there is amazing work that is being 
being done now, and I can't say enough about these wonderful people here. This is David Solomons, Lord Andrew Stone, Dr. Urban Laszlo, and his wonderful wife, Karita. Dr. Urban Laszlo is a three-time Nobel Peace Prize nominee and the founder of the Club of Budapest, and he now has the Laszlo um, Institute of New Paradigm Research. We are collaborating on a number of things. He and I are actually in the process of writing a book together, combining all of our different work. Um, and of course, we we'll enjoy collaborating with people that are doing incredible things in the world. Um, there's stuff that's happening there that I can't say right now, but stay tuned in November. This is something that we are super excited about and we think will help address some of the issues of gun violence in the United States, among other things. Um, I want to recognize uh, Reverend Neil Thomas, who's been one of our big supporters in the community. He is in charge of the Cathedral of Hope. So, of course, a lot of advocacy against anti-LGBT you know, um, um, initiatives, you know, people that are just really homophobic. Um, he works with the community in trying to reach out and help people recognize their common humanity uh, because his congregation deals with so much stuff. And this was done after an unfortunate shooting in which we had many, many people coming out to basically, here's Isabel, um, they were sending messages of hope um, and uh, prayers and whatnot to many places around the world that have um, been assaulted. And one of those places was in New Zealand. So um, we were able to go in and deliver this into the mosque that was destroyed. And a lot of people don't, not destroy, but the people were shot. And not many people in the United States realized, but that literally right after that mosque was shot up, Someone drove by with a flatbed truck that had a mock-up of our wall, and it had all sorts of basically stuff that was inspired by American politics, um, and it was obviously linked with the actual shooting and time to occur right after the shooting. So as people are sitting out there bloody, they're seeing horrendous things that are coming from America um, in terms of symbolism. And you know, so what they really needed, and they they had us, and normally Moscow places for men and women to each are designated to walk through but they invited us to take this beautiful message that was signed from people from all over which thank you Neil for hosting it and to walk it through every aspect of the mosque because they felt that by walking through with the intention and prayers and healing it was Texans recognizing the kind of hatred that had come out of our country unfortunately and poured into theirs and they said that it was one of the most healing things they could have also we ended up bringing one of the um, Maori uh, chieftains Wang Tanoa, and she ended up um, being the first Maori Maori going into their mosque, and it was the first Maori. Um, she and Marama, who was another friend of hers, um, were basically the first time that they all connected. So that was beautiful. You know, having people that were recent immigrants with the original people within New Zealand. Of course, many of you know Peggy Larney. She's just a beautiful human being that's done so many good things in the community that we've been blessed to collaborate with in the past. Um, this is Suleiman Hamani, and we have been very blessed to collaborate with the Ismali community in the past, and that is largely done through his initiatives. And I like this photograph because, you know, we've been blessed to work with the Igbo community, with Kluzad, Suleiman, you know, with the Ismali community, Gregory with the Native American community. So each of these gentlemen is bringing whole communities in, you know, and it's really important. And there's a difference also between the African American community and the recent indigenous African communities. And having conversations going between them is important. So it's, you know, this is the kind of work that we do. And the Mask for Life, which was our campaign to get KN95 masks, this just gives you an idea of how many, the degree to which we were able to get all over the country and um, outside of our country. It was a massive undertaking, and there's not enough words to recognize everybody here. Um, obviously, the Mexican consulate played a role in helping us get them into Mexico, but we had people from all over um, that were helping us. So just to give you guys a look at that, the degree of that. So... And in the past, you know, some people sadly have passed away. This is Imam Baba Mata, but this was something that we did in Mauritania where they had extremists that were going by and the extremists were telling people to um, that the um, their, basically their holy books should, said you should kill everybody with HIV and AIDS. And you know, what they were doing is they were taking advantage of people that were illiterate. So they ended up bringing together ministers, priests, 
rabbis and imams that went into all these different places in a caravan and just set up and said, we're not going to tell you what to think. We're going to tell you, um, teach you how to read. And then after they would teach people how to read, they would go through you know, the Koran. They would go through the Bible. They would go through the Torah. And they would say, nowhere here does it say that you should kill somebody because they have a sickness. In fact, you should care for them. And so it was a very risky thing that they did, but they did an amazing job of outreach and having an impact throughout Mauritania. And it would take that kind of initiative to address the rise of terrorism. Um, over here we have Mike Hogue, who is a developer in Dallas, and he wanted to make sure that his development, and I really want to give a shout out to him, because he wanted to make sure his development was part of the answers um, to helping society evolve. So he's not just building buildings, he's trying to make a positive impact in our society and in our city, and he called up the UN and said, tell me how I can work with sustainable development goals, and we are so grateful for our late friend Lawrence Bloom, who was on our advisory board, for connecting us, because Mike Hogue is the one that has donated the land, and this is the hamak about the building that Keith Critchlow um, designed that will be there. This is showing the, um, the building that he designed. But Keith Critchlow, um, having his genius, it will be the first time his buildings have ever really been in this part of the United States. I think there's one building over in Denver, um, but it's nothing to the size and scale of this. And there's a lot more on that history there of why this is actually highly, highly significant. But... Um, we're incredibly excited. So many, many thanks to my code, because as you can see, with the large scope of work we have been doing all over the world, um, being able to, uh, to have something like this will allow us to just quadruple our work and outreach and empower our community further. Um, this is Dr. Philip Shinoda, and he's holding an award that we are so grateful to, the Peace and Justice Center, um, which used to be Vivian Castleberry's organization. And... Um, they gave us an award for Green Source, Steve W., and it, he, we need to acknowledge he's, that was his vision, so we wanted to have him holding that. Um, this is one of the Squattable Box, um, the very first prototype, and you can see the size of it and with the Maya in it. Um, it will be a way to bring education to areas where you have um, people that don't feel like they have enough um, Options. So you have a young ch child, and or not young child, but you have a young adult that has an opportunity to go for a scholarship somewhere. They're usually not going to because they feel responsible to have a job to put food on the table for their community, you know, for their family. If they're not helping to feed their siblings and their grandparents, they feel guilty. So often families can't get off that wheel. But by being able to take advantage of online curricula and bring that kind of thing into places in third world scenarios, we will be able to help people to improve their lives by being able to finish their high school diploma and get their degree around their own schedule. But we're not just going to be offering this kind of thing. We're extremely excited about collaborating um, with uh, The Loving Classroom, which was um, over here. You know, with David Solomons, and not shown here is David Geffen, um, but we'll be doing a whole presentation on that, hopefully either at RSA or the House of Lords in November, so stay tuned on that. Um, over here, we are deeply honored to be able to participate. The commissary is very necessary, which is Marcus's um, vision. Marcus has been doing amazing work both here in Dallas and in Baltimore. This was an opportunity where he invited us to come in, and I was allowed to um, give a whole workshop on helping um, these different students. They went from very young to college age on how to speak publicly or in an interview, how to present themselves and how to own their power. So those are some of the more informal things we have. This just gives you an idea of some of the people in the community that we end up working with. Here's Marcus. Um, and how we're able to you know, focus on different things. This was food justice. Obviously, um, Coke Buchanan. We could not have done what we've done, which has been enormous, without him. Um, I mentioned before the first treaty um, alliance in 300 years between the Hopi and Navajo nations, and this is that photograph um, showing that work. <laughs> and it's uh, it's still surreal when I think about that. Mikshuni Hozong, she was the first person that uh, was brought in, and if this idea was by the dean of the Perkins School of Theology, and we are so deeply grateful to Reverend Dr. Robert Hunt who came up with that idea. I hope Wiki can relaunch it, but we were doing that with SMU, um, and that was just a wonderful, wonderful thing that was happening. So, almost done here. <laughs> we really fight very big against anti-Semitism. We have that international chapter, you know, in Israel, 
in Palestine, and so we're big about interfaith work. Um, so that's Hanan Schlesinger. This is Rabbi Abraham Berkowitz, who we work with. Um, our international chapters sometimes work with each other. So this is Reverend Hermiano, who was Shinto, who was visiting over there, um, over here, and we're going to be having him come this later this um, on September first. So stay tuned, Rabbi Joshua Stanton. Um, he is uh, going to be speaking. Um, in this particular situation, we were. Um, working on all the anti-immigrant hate stuff that was happening. This is Reverend uh, Dr. Chloe Breyer, who oversees the Interface Center of New York. So you can get an idea of just the kind of work that we've been blessed to do um, and who we've been blessed to work with. I'm just very, um, just in awe. So this is Rabbi Yusuf. Uh, <clears throat> So anyway, over here we have um, Anthony Chisholm. This was in Rwanda, and he was interacting with a little girl. People were just absolutely amazed that they were seeing a black man with glasses, and you know, so they were just in awe of him. And it was a, a real moment for Anthony to realize that it was so incredible, and how what a privilege it was to have glasses. <laughs> but I include that photo because it was one of the earliest things that shaped us. Um, some of our work that we ended up doing over in Austria. And it is just, um, you know, because we don't do theory, I mean, we do theory, but we apply it and we have this history behind it. We were invited to go into Design Me a Planet and to talk about how we move from philosophy and intellectual stuff, which is important, and to actual application and doing this kind of work. So this is the kind of thing that we've um, been doing largely in different parts of Europe as well. Um, this was a publication we did with the Club of Budapest um, and our you know, and the Mimsy Institute um, together, and um, it just, it published a lot of things on what was actively working. Um, and so anyway, that's um, the Empower Magazine. Um, but anyway, so this gives you an idea of some of the things, people that we have been working with. This is Tanya Arrialas Rodriguez, who did that incredible school. She was the architect and is continuing to do incredible work. We're so grateful that she is on our board of directors. But as you can see, I mean, and this is just a tiny, tiny glimpse of the work that we have been doing for years and years and years. And it has been a privilege. It is something that blows my mind when I look back at it. Um, and just in a glance, you know, yes, we're international. We're local enough that we have Green Source DFW, Food Source DFW, but they're out, you know, they've grown so much that they are now um, nationwide. Uh, we are blessed to be working in places all over the world, Israel, Palestine, Mexico, Japan. Uh, we are blessed to be able to collaborate with people all over the world in order to basically help people become a conscious cultural creator. In other words, your impact in this world is going to be there whether you want it or not. So you better be conscious of it because that's how we create the culture around us. And right now in our country, we are dealing with such antagonism and extremism and people are not allowing for each other to discover their common humanity. So doing this work as globalization increases and it's not going to go back. People seem to hate globalists, but you know, if you recognize that we are now economically and sociologically and environmentally interdependent, then we better as a species take our responsibility um, in a serious way. And better yet, in a joyful way. How can we joyfully become responsible for each other in our impact in this world? So anyway, this gives you a little bit of history of the Mimnazine Institute and a little bit of the understanding of our impact. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy this little walk down memory lane up into the present and into the future to get an idea of the kind of things we do. Um, I certainly was not expecting to do this kind of video. <laughs> so you don't see me in my absolute best, just in my dinosaur t-shirt. <laughs> but um, I just want to take advantage of this moment to let you know the kind of impact and the amount of people it has taken to make this impact. I am deeply grateful to every single